Hi everybody, it's Jay and I am back in the booth again with you for another sneak peek video preview of this week's audiobook release here on Say With Jay. Our release this week is Dreaming of His Convenient Kiss, and it's the second book in Jesse's Cowboy Mountain Christmas Sweet Romance series. Before we get to that, though, last week uh, I had asked for anyone if you had any questions for me at all, whether about audiobooks or the creation process or about me, to send them in and we would do a Q&A session. I'll be honest, I didn't expect the response to be quite this good and uh, didn't expect to have so many questions already, but since I did get such an overwhelming response, I thought I would go ahead and do a short Q&A session today. Now, I'll say up front, no way I could get to all the questions that were submitted, uh, but uh, we're not going to throw them away. We will either do another session down the road, or we can maybe pick up one or two questions a week. Uh, in fact, why don't you let me know what you'd like to see in the comments below? Uh, also. If you come up with any other questions that you might have, you can still email those to me at saywithj at gmail.com. Same goes if you come up with any ideas for these little opening segments that you'd like to see. I'd love to hear from you in the comments again or at that email address and let us know what you think. Okay, our first question today comes from Karen Simones and she asked, how did you get started doing audios and is this your full-time job? Some of you may have already heard this story, so I apologize. You may not know about me that one of my hobbies is video gaming. I love playing video games, have for years and years and years, and I play very frequently with two of my best friends in the world, and as we're playing, we're, you know, we have voice communication set up, and so we're constantly talking all night you know, uh, while we play. And for literally years, I have tortured these poor people with funny voices or imitations. I've sung on occasion. Um, I tell dad jokes. And then one day out of the blue, or maybe out of desperation to get me to quit doing whatever I was doing, I don't know. Um, one of my friends asked if I had ever considered doing audiobooks. At the time, the last audiobook I had heard was literally a book on tape. You know, when you used to get the big binders, like full of 10 or 12 cassette tapes. Um, and so I said, you know, that would be great, but um, you know, I have no idea how you even do that. And, and kind of left it at that. Well, the very next day, uh, my friend basically did the homework for me. And I should mention, she has glaucoma and has difficulty reading sometimes, so she listens to a ton of audiobooks. So I guess she knew, knew what she was talking about, but she went and looked up uh, a website called acx.com. ACX, which stands for the Audiobook Collective Exchange, is a company owned by Audible and Amazon, and what they do is match independent narrators with independent authors. So in other words, authors who might not have a big publishing house behind them that has their own internal audiobook department, but still wants to get audiobooks for their books. And basically it's like a bulletin board service where they post, hey, I want an audiobook for my book. Here's a, here's a little uh, script, download it, give me a sample, and an audition, so to speak. Narrators, on the other hand, look for books that they might like to do, and it basically matches us up. And so, you know, uh, if she went to that much trouble for me, she must have believed that I could do this. So I started investigating it myself, and kind of the rest is history. Um, I did a few books of, of various types, and it was after I did a three book series called Mount, uh, The Adventures of a Mountain Man, uh, that Jesse came to me and asked if I might be interested in doing a sweet romance. And at the time, I, I had no idea what a sweet romance even was. And 
I mean, she literally had to explain to me what the genre was about. But uh, we went on to make uh, The Cowboy Marries His Best Friend. At the time, I think it was Cowboys Don't Marry Their Best Friend. Um, or The Cowboy's Best Friend. And it was also named Cowboys Don't Marry Their Best Friend. There we go. But it was the first of the Sweetwater books. And it's just gone from there. The second part of your question, is it my full-time job? It is as of January of this year. Um, I decided, I had the opportunity and decided to pursue this full-time and uh, been blessed to do so. Uh, it did, <clears throat> coincidentally, um, coincide with my day job of 23 years, uh, ending after the company that I worked for decided they didn't need me anymore. But as I said, um, after a lot of consideration and prayer, uh, I realized what a godsend that was, because I truly do feel like this is my calling. And that old adage uh, about find something you love and you'll never work a day in your life, well, that's, that's bunk. I, uh, boy, I work a lot, but I enjoy it more than I could ever, ever imagine. Now, that kind of leads into the next question from Betty Vanderweer. Now that you're doing audiobooks full time, how has your life changed? Again, it's been just such a blessing to be able to do this. I wake up every morning eager to hit the ground and and do whatever's in front of me. Um, <clears throat> it's I mean it's exciting. It's it's always different, and I, I'm I find myself much more at peace with my life and what I'm doing, and a good bit of that is because I get to work with somebody like Jesse. I guess it's, it's also changed in that by being basically self-employed now, like a, I'm sure some of you are, you learn pretty quick, um, the buck stops with you. Um, there, there is no passing something off onto somebody else or putting it off because maybe somebody else will do it or it'll just go away. Uh, if it's gonna get done, you get to be the one to do it. So you learn to be a lot more self-reliant and self-responsible and self-motivated, I guess. I love this next question. It's from Kitty Elder. And she asked, when narrating a book, do you ever forget what voice you're using for a particular character? Absolutely. Um, not so much for the main character's as I'm doing a book, um, more usually for like, like secondary characters, like for instance, in last week's book, Cowboy Finding Love, uh, the Peacemakers, remembering what all four of those ladies' voices were um, from, from book to book uh, can be a bit of a challenge sometimes. So what I do as I'm recording, uh, when I when I have somebody who's new and when they say a few lines of dialogue, I'll stop and make a little snippet of just those few sentences and save that little sound file on my computer here. And that way, you know, when I either later on in the book or in a different book entirely, uh, I can come back and just play that little snippet and remember what that voice was. It is also kind of handy for early on in a book for dialing in the hero and heroine. Um, you know, sometimes, especially when you're just getting started, you want to make sure you get that voice really consistent. Um, and it also kind of helps me with what I call hero drift. Um, like, for instance, uh, in Cowboy Finding Love last week, Silas Powers, he was the youngest Powers brother uh, I kind of envision him with sort of a higher voice, still got that kind of breathy hero kind of sound. But the problem with a voice like that, when it's a little higher pitched, when you get into an intimate conversation with someone, and I don't even mean romantic, I just mean in close proximity, you kind of tend to lower your voice when you talk to people. And the challenge is when you finish that conversation, and you come back out and you're talking normally again, you got to remember that your voice isn't down here. It's up here where you started. So 
the little snippet like that can keep you from drifting differently and keeping it consistent. Okay, next, uh, this is kind of a combination question. Tamson Forey asked, do you read an edited copy, i.e., is the version you read edited with notes on different voices or other narrator needed tidbits, or the ebook format any reader would read? And Kathy Munsell added, what are you reading from? So let me show you. Here is actually my view from my side of the microphone. Uh, you can see my microphone there. There's my computer monitor with my sound recording software loaded and up and ready to go. And there is my Samsung Galaxy Tab 8. Uh, it's just a little tablet that I've got uh, hooked to that weird gooseneck arm thing. And I've got my script on there. And the handy thing is, as I read when I'm ready to do another page, I just reach out and scroll up the page. It's nice and quiet and quick. But the cool thing about this tablet is it comes with this little stylus. And with this pen, uh, as I'm reading through, like my pre-read, I can make little notes like questions I need to ask Jesse or words I might need to check the pronunciation on or something like that, or, you know, just whatever kind of notes I need to make. So in that sense, it is edited with notes, and I love this narrator needed tidbits. That is, that's my new favorite saying, and that is indeed what I read on. Early Hedrian asked, Hendrian, excuse me, Early, is there a difference in putting audiobooks on YouTube than Audible? The answer, the short answer is no. Um, uh, in fact, I use the exact same sound files either way. Of course, the uploading process is different for the two different sites, uh, where Audible, you upload one chapter at a time, YouTube is one big video. But that's the biggest difference, is that for YouTube, I have the added step of having to create the video. I like doing the little uh, animated video backgrounds, the looping videos for each chapter, um, because I think it can help enhance the story some. I never try to retell the book through those scenes, but it, you know, for people who might be watching or might be listening on, the, on a computer and have the screen up in front of them, or you know, people who might be using the YouTube app on their smart TV and having it playing in their den. Uh, it's something, to, it's something to, to watch while you listen. So creating the video is the only added step. Otherwise, it's the same thing. But a great question. Thank you. Next, <laughs> my friend Lois Bergman wants to know, are you limited on YouTube to release only one audiobook a week? No, they, they are happy for me to put as many videos as I can up. Um, no, the, the limitation there, uh, the, the slow gear in the production machine is this guy. Um, no, it's most narrators, uh, I think as a rule of thumb, you can count on four to five hours of actual work going into every hour of finished audio. So Jesse's books, for instance, run about six hours long. Um, that times five, that's 30 hours of actual work that needs to be done to make that six hour uh, audiobook. On top of that, uh, you never work at 100% efficiency. You're always you know, interrupted by emails or phone calls, or uh, you've got things that you have to take care of on social media or whatever the interruption might be. Then, as we just discussed, Creating the YouTube video itself uh, is fairly time consuming, so you can add that in. And you can see how that fills up a week's schedule very, very quickly. So it's not a YouTube limitation, it's a limitation of how many hours you've got in the day. Now, the good news is, as I do this more, hopefully I'm becoming more efficient, a little faster, and I'll get better at it, and we can put up more for you to watch and listen to. Um, and then finally, this week, uh, Alexa Verda asked, are you going to show more previews where you cook? The answer is unequivocally, yes, we will. Um, I may have mentioned this in one of the other videos, but Jesse had a brilliant idea when she and I were discussing some things we could do in these previews. Um, 
And she suggested, well, why don't I write some dishes into my books and you can cook that recipe? And that's what we're doing uh, with her Coming Home to North Dakota series. So every time we do one of those books, you can look for a cooking video from me. In fact, I already know what we're going to cook in the next Coming Home book, and I'm really, really excited for it because uh, I haven't cooked it in a while for me, and honestly, I'm just kind of hungry now thinking about it. Anyway, there we go. Those are some questions that came in. Again, we've got a ton more, and we will get to them. Thank you so much for responding so well. If you think of any more questions, again, leave them in the comments or email them to saywithj at gmail.com. If you've got any suggestions for things you'd like to see here in these little intro segments, leave that too. Okay, now, on to this week's preview. Dreaming of His Convenient Kiss is the second book in Jesse's Cowboy Mountain Christmas Small Town Sweet Romance series, and it's the story of Natalie Moody, a single mother of five, who finds herself desperately looking for a place to live after she was evicted from the home she was renting when it became condemned. A friend at church offers to let her move into his brother's vacant farmhouse while he's out on assignment, and she jumps at the chance. It's also about another one of the Barclay family, this time brother Denver. Denver is an underwater welder, and as you can imagine, the job market for underwater welding in Mistletoe, Arkansas, is not that great. So he's away from home a good bit. Uh, he's recently bought a farm, uh, doesn't know if or when he's going to move into it. Uh, he wants to, but he can't really seem to decide to settle down. Well, you can imagine his surprise when he does finally come home and finds there's somebody already in his house. Uh, this story is a, is a great, great tale. Uh, it's, it's got everything you could possibly want. There's romance. There's a marriage of convenience. There is a home invasion and a toilet falls on somebody. And trust me, those last two things are actually hilarious. Um, it is a great story uh, that is about a marriage of convenience, but these two learn that maybe this marriage of convenience could lead them to finding true love. Do they? You know the answer. You've got to come back this Friday to see the full video on Say With Jay. But for now, here is a sample of Dreaming of His Convenient Kiss. Hope you enjoy it. And do come back Friday for the full release here on. The afternoon grew steadily busier as people seemed to return from their Black Friday Christmas shopping, deciding they wanted to grab a tree while they were at it. His stomach was growling, and he was thirsty, as supper time came and went. He'd just finished wrapping a tree and had directed the man carrying it over to the market to pay Natalie when something tugged at his shirt. Hey, mister, a small voice beside him said. He looked down at the little girl that had been bleeding in the bathroom. She had a Band-Aid over her forehead now, and he couldn't remember the name that Natalie had said. Ramona? Maybe. Yeah? Here. She held up a cold bottle of water and a sandwich with what might be turkey in it. He looked at her fingers. He'd seen sidewalks that were cleaner, but he was kind of hungry and he wasn't being picky. That was awfully nice of you, Miss Ramona. Her chin went up and down and up and down in a cute, jerky way. Thank you, he said as he took the sandwich from her hand. Only two pieces of turkey fell out from the bottom before he could squeeze it tight. Mommy made it. You can tell your mom I appreciate it. Her little brows tilted in, and her eyes clenched up. Appreciate? Tell her I said thank you. Tell her... He wasn't sure if the little girl could deliver the message or not, but he figured he'd try. 
Thanks for thinking of me. The little girl nodded again and skipped off. He noticed then that the other four children were sitting at the picnic table, with the oldest one feeding the youngest one what looked like maybe Cheerios, and the rest of them had sandwiches. Natalie was checking customers out again. If she'd eaten a sandwich, he hadn't seen it. I'll put your tree on the shaker, and then I'll be right back, he said to the man who was next. The fellow, in overalls with a big gray beard, nodded and looked at his wife, who looked exactly like him, except no beard. You eat your sandwich, Sonny. We've been standing here for a while. Won't hurt us none to stand here for another five minutes. You get some supper in your gizzard. The lady's green eyes sparkled, set as they were in a face wreathed with laugh lines. She looked about as friendly as everyone else who had been here today. Man, he hadn't spent nearly enough time in his hometown. He needed to fix that. Sticking his sandwich in his mouth and holding it there while he uncapped his bottle of water, he grabbed hold of it again, chugging half the bottle before taking a bite of sandwich and walking over. Chewing was overrated. That's what his parents had always teased him that he thought, anyway, and the sandwich was in his stomach before he made it to the market. The bottled water was empty. Did you eat? He asked when he was just a couple of feet away from Natalie's side. She had just taken a handsaw from a customer and given him a total for his tree, and she jerked her head around. She hadn't known he was coming. I will. I'm just busy. Go sit down and eat. You haven't eaten anything all day. If she'd had any lunch, he missed it. Maybe she ate breakfast. But he wasn't going to quibble over the details. Her eyes flashed. He figured she didn't appreciate being told what to do. Are you stopping to eat too? My sandwich is already in my stomach. I'd show you, but it might gross someone out. She pursed her lips. He figured he'd probably been on a ship surrounded by men for way too long, because she didn't really think his humor was very funny. Okay, he needed to try to do a little better. He thought he'd be relieved she told him no. He found, though, that he kind of wanted her, if not to accept his marriage proposal, to at least like him. He definitely seemed to like watching her anyway. He liked the way her eyes flashed. He definitely liked the fact that she thought of him when she was feeding everyone. Someone needed to think of her. He was as good as anyone for that job. Hi, this is Jay, and thanks for listening. If you're ready for another great audiobook, here's one we think you might like. Or check out the playlist with all our latest releases. Don't forget to subscribe to Say With Jay, give this video a thumbs up, and tell us what you liked in the comments.